Hi, this is Privateer Station, and today we're bringing you a special, an hour-long lecture by Ekaterina Shulman, a prominent Russian political scientist, a PhD in politology, who also had to leave the country, emigrate. She is now a fellow at Robert Bosch uh, Stiftung in Germany, and also a professor at uh, Kazakh University, Kazgu by Naribayev. In this lecture, she dives deep into three possible scenarios for Putin's Russia. What will happen to that country as the result of the war it started? If you really like to look under the hood and understand things deeper, this is one of those lectures. Enjoy. Hello. My name is Ekaterina Shulman. I am a politologist. I am a PhD in political science. And by request of Ilya Yashin, we will talk today about scenarios of possible future for Russia. We'll talk about directions, how events can unfold there. In order to touch this rather vast topic, we need to come to several understandings beforehand. First of all, we need to understand what political prognostication is. From our science, politology, just like from any other science, people do expect uh, some prognostication capabilities. Of course, the question coming to us from an average Joe, why do we need you if you cannot, as a result of your research, tell us what will happen later? We understand that uh, it's not only politologists who suffer from such point of view. Meteorologists, psychologists, doctors, many others, they do suffer from the same concept. People usually await some simple, 100% forecastable picture of the future. Humans worry quite a bit, normally. They are concerned that there are small entities in a big world where very few things are predictable, so people do want to have some stability and some knowledge about future. Those people who parasitize on that are actually those who sell these 100% true predictions. Astrologists, tarot card readers, and all kinds of other seers. Because on one hand, everything that they say is rather believable. On the other hand, it's rather foggy. Woody Allen, in one of his talented works, advised how to be a forecaster. If you're going to forecast anything, be brief and vague. Like he brought an example, two armies will start the battle, but only one of them will win. But you know, in today's world, uh, even that may not always happen. Two armies may start the battle, but uh, what is victory? What does it look like? Who we can say won? sometimes is a bit foggy. So what can political science prognosticate? What can we do and what can we not do or should we not do? We should not be all ever selling the data that this is how things going to be 100% ever. Because how do you get if the person is true scientist or if he's a charlatan? Charlatan has everything straightforward. Everything is clear. A proper scientist will never have such a picture. In a social space, anything can happen. Everything that is not physically impossible can happen. People can behave themselves in any way they want. Just think about it. It seems obvious, but in reality, it's rather horrible. People behave themselves in any way they like. This is our human nature. We adapt to conditions and we adapt conditions to our liking. Human is different from other biological creatures on this planet. It lives anywhere, it's different things, and nature suggests that it doesn't suggest anything. It only suggests us to adapt to survive. So there is no wild, strange scenario that would not be ancient tradition for somebody. Hence, there is not a constellation or a combination of individual and group behavior that would not be able to occur. 
Were people cannibalizing each other? They were. Were they sacrificing their kids? They were. Were they protecting their kids? Of course they were. So any combination of anything. And that's why in politology we have only one law. Dead people did not rise. That's true. That at least we haven't seen yet. Everything else happens. So we will never say that it will be 100% like this, but it will never be 100% like this. What we say is that there are more favorable and less favorable scenarios, more likely scenarios, less likely scenarios. In order to have some scientific base, we should come up with at least three scenarios. And that's what we'll try to do today. None of them will happen with 100% probability, but none of them can be excluded. In a good scientific order, we actually should have five scenarios, but we don't have time for that, so we'll have three. What else is precarious? We are describing these scenarios as some sort of ideal models. It doesn't mean that ideal is perfect. It means that this is a possible model. In, in order to, to describe that, we need to remember that in real life, in social space, nothing develops on a straight line. In real life, none of these scenarios will occur in a 100% clear fashion. Different elements of different scenarios will occur, but this makes our task more difficult. And the whole world, word that we're using, scenario, also leads us to a, a bit different area by the nature of the word. What is scenario? Scenario is a storyline for a theatrical play or a movie. When we talk about scenario, very often we can imagine a director, a group of actors who are following his orders. So when we start thinking about that scenario direction, some people may get an illusion of omnipotence that will write out the scenarios, give all the real people their place, and there'll be a director with a loudspeaker who will be arranging them and telling them to go one way or another. Nothing like that happens in reality. There are no scenario writers. There are no puppeteers. What is closer to reality is how the whole world is described in war and peace, war and society. That the whole world is akin of a big beehive, where each bee is making its own decision. But as a result, as a group, at the end of it, it creates a reality. And this is one of the mysteries of political processes, that the result that occurred was achieved by a plethora of people. Each of them wanted to achieve something for himself or herself, but they were not going to that result. They were achieving their own goals. They, many of them didn't even see that end result in their mind. And political actors, they act in the same way. Moreover, political actors doesn't really have capacity to understand the result and outcome of their actions. And the higher they are in hierarchy, the more engulfed they are in daily vortexes that they need to react to. We often think that the higher you get, then the smarter Olympic godlike people become. And they observe everything from the height of their position and nothing disturbs them. But I would repeat again, in reality, the higher the boss you are, the more you are stuck in an idiotic vortex. You're doing all kinds of ceremonial, formal, ritual actions. Your planning horizon is yesterday. The closer other people are to that big boss, the more they see of that principle because they serve that big boss and they really have zero time to think and analyze. And also, that's a good no note here, pay less attention to insider sources. In order to understand at a rookery or bird gathering, you do not need to interview a seal. And even a seagull would not know much. And the birds usually don't have time to talk. They need to find food to protect their kids, fight with their neighbors, so they usually don't have a holistic picture. Only a researcher would have a more or less holistic picture of what's happening. But unfortunately, researchers understand best things that have already happened. But people demand prognostication about the future, about what will happen tomorrow. 
So these are our difficulties. That everything is possible, nothing can be excluded. Not a single scenario will be fully realized, but most likely there will be elements of different ones combined together. And there is no single individual or collective will that is guiding everybody. This is actually one of the most common illusions of control, one of the most dangerous ones. That's why people assign godlike features to power, because they want to see that there is some joint will, some unified will that is guiding everybody. And it's easier to believe that this will is evil than to believe that it doesn't exist. A story by Borges, Kleon Akbar or Bistertsis tells about that story. People dread the thought of chaos so much that they're eager to believe a thought about the, an evil will, because it's better than the other option. But in reality, there is no world government. There is no world governor. If you ever tried to manage anything, even repairs of your apartment, you roughly understand what I'm talking about. You understand this woeful limitations of power. Even if you have authority, even if you have money, everyone whom we name agents in our science, and you'd be a principal, you'd be the one ordering the research, agent will still be doing whatever they please, and you'll be managing in a very relative way. So, after having cried about our difficulties, let's try to come to what's possible and what can we predict. With prognostication and politics, there is one main rule. What do we call rule of thumb? We deal with larger, lar rather large political systems, societies at large. These are huge bodies that have inertia. So, in general, they usually replicate themselves in time. Something rather extraordinary needs to happen in order to change their trajectory drastically. This is on one hand. On the other hand, due to the largesse of their dimensions, they are like a living body. They consist of a lot of living cells. It's renews, renewable, it continuously renews, but it still sustains the same shape. So what goes out of this is that, most likely, the most probable scenario is an inertia scenario. We usually give that scenario, traditionally, 80 to 85%. It basically tells you tomorrow will be very similar to today. Today grows from the past, from yesterday, and tomorrow grows from today. In meteorology, essentially the same principle works, most of the time. Most likely weather prediction is that tomorrow will be very similar weather to today. 80% of time, this is exactly what happens. But, as you understand, if that rule worked 100% of time, we wouldn't have change of weather and change of seasons. If we would have continuous growth of 100% the same thing, there would not be change, there would not be progress or regress historical catastrophe or renaissance, doesn't matter, but changes occur. So, our inertia scenario will just give as one of the main ones. And let's try to draft general lines of that for Russia. Going from a whole to a particular. In our case, we have a political system that was growing and forming and coming to power and learning for about a quarter of a century. Some people think longer, but let's take a quarter of a century. What is the nature of that system? This is an authoritarian regime based on resources that concentrates economic resources and enforcement resources in the hands of a small group that is led by and looks up to its leader. That is why it is known as personalist autocracy. Why are we saying that it's a resource autocracy, or some people call it petrocracy. This regime is based on the extraction of natural resources and its sale across the border to other countries, and it lives on the monies derived from that sale. This is a very primitive political model, and that affords a totalitarian tendency, because you have a certain resource that is easy to monopolize. If you are living off people's taxes, 
if your income is more diversified, then you have to deal with your taxpayers somehow, give them some rights, consider their opinion, because you do want their money. If you, but if you are digging something from the ground, then you can just put the border around, guard it and protect it, and you don't really need to trade or con be concerned with any people living on your territory. At the first step of solidarization of your autocracy would be to capture these resources from those people whom you do not trust and give them to your friends. And after that, your task is only to make sure that property and political power remains in power of those, remains in the hands of those who support your power. And then you need to create a situation in the country where these assets and that social capital can be transferred to your children as inheritance so that your friends can also do that. First is easy to achieve. Second is rather easy to achieve as well because system supports itself, it's in homeostasis and doesn't quite want change. The third is more difficult. One can say that democratic mechanism, mechanism of social rotation is invented in order to make sure that inheritance happens peacefully. But for that to happen peacefully, you need not to concentrate these resources, but to still distribute it in your society. You will still have elites, you will still have rich and uber rich, and social capital will be inherited accordingly. Children of professors are most likely to become professors as well, then children of uh, blue-collar workers. This is the usual social laws, social laws of elites. But then the question is about the degree of sharing, the degree of concentration. As the uh, deceased Minister of Finance Lifshitz said, we got to share. So this was the general overview that can help us to understand the situation that Russian political system finds itself now. I think, and the more time it passes since the beginning of the war, the stronger I think that this is the probability that the war was not intended to be a war. It was intended to be a special operation. It was intended to be a conservative thing to not change things, but to save things, to prevent political changes that would happen otherwise with the generational change in Russia. We understand that even that poor diffusion of riches that was happening in 2000, 2010, it was causing certain political processes, describing it in simpler terms, growing city population, I wouldn't even call them middle class, just the workers of post-industrial economy who lived in cities and large agglomerations, they demanded different conditions for their work. They wanted to transfer from centralized industrial economy to the market, to the open economy. That transition requires different political framework. Otherwise, you cannot grow further. That well-known trap of the middle income, median income, it's a situation where the countries of the second world, while they grow, 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 and then reach some glass ceiling, I would not be scaring you with uh, the amount of money you need to earn per person, per capita, what it means, that capita, because different researchers have different numbers. But there is a certain number, X, of income per capita, after which you either need to switch to a more democratic form of society to continue development, or you need to roll back to preserve power. So either you're going further on the road of progress, but then you need to start sharing your power, or you need to make your people poor again. And that post-industrial economy needs to be stifled in some fashion, so that most people would still be working in industrial production in this case. And it will be either government controlled or government managed. And your close friends will be owning the assets of most of these companies. They're usually called oligarchs. Let's not deep dive into that terminology, but that will be still a space for monopolization, but not space for competition. That is what the trap is about. Russia is classically in that trap. And now they have two options. You either break out of that ceiling or you go down. And I think that the beginning of this war was 
very specific but a conserving measure to preclude further growth, to scare citizens who live in large cities and who are protesting against the current government to reshare, redivide money in favor of his own cronies and his own oligarchs and military industrial complex in Russia, because that will lead to preserving his power, the current state, not uh, growth and change. But what happened? War turned out to be not a special operation. The war turned out to be something else. And the system is really not well equipped for war. By the way, Intel services are also poor. They don't perform duties at well. Their border is not really guarded well. And during all these times, we're watching how parts of that system that it's so loudly prompt up everywhere, army, special services, and even propaganda, they're all buckling under the pressure. You will see the continuation of the process that is going since 2016, to which propaganda machine was not reacting properly all the time. This war doesn't quite work for Russia. Moreover, this war continuing continues to produce situations that put Putin's power at risk. Prigozhin's mutiny is a good example of that. They wanted to create a situation when elites wanted to give their riches to their kids. And as a result, they got constant instability, risks and threats to our property, to our perspectives and to our children. What to do with that? So far, the answer is uh, no how. The system is very inertia based and li it continues living through different crisis situations without much damage to itself. And it still thinks that the best way to, is to do nothing. Escalate things out outward, outwards. Like in 2015, they managed to distract the world from what was happening in Donetsk and Lugansk by starting a new stage in Syria. If Russia would not interfere, Assad would most likely be gone by now. But Russia decided to interfere and the conflict became permanent and then the world would uh, need to start to negotiate with Russia and had to freeze the Donbass conflict. Now I think Russia is trying to do something like that in Africa. This is not my exact area of political research, but I think this is where the next point of destruction would be. The main idea with current government in Russia is that let's freeze, let's hold the current line of the front. What they insist to call on international communities, let's acknowledge the current facts on the ground. If you cannot push us out, let's just freeze everything and let us uh, stay with the territories that we occupied. Just like a song in the 90s said, do not dream about the future, let's leave everything as it is. I don't know why I'm remembering that, but that's, uh, I think, the real anthem to Russian Federation. Let's leave things as they are. Everything would be okay if not the circumstance that I noticed above. That system started a war that it cannot wage. It's not even the issue that they didn't reach Kiev as they planned. It's the problem that all the efforts of Russian political machine are going towards pretending that nothing is happening, to supporting the homeostasis. Like in Lewis Carroll, you need to run twice faster to just be where you are. And at this moment, you also need to do that and try to evade the drones that are starting to fly across the border. So the war is against the system's nature. That system is a printer, it's not a tank. And it was torn from the electric plug, put in a field, and was ordered to become a tank. Printer, now you're a tank. So it's trying, it's flopping its lids, it's blinking the eyes, suggests to print something pretty, but doesn't quite work as a tank. Patriotic society in Russia thinks that mass executions might help to increase the productivity of people, of the military industrial complex. So basically they're suggesting to lift this printer higher and smash it on the ground harder, and it should turn into the tank then. The opinion of the political group of uh, Putin's administration, political wing, thinks that uh, 
If you print nice looking wheels and glue them to the printer, it might even look as a tank from afar. But what it means for our scenario is that our scenario is inertial. The most likely scenario is inertial and it's a degradation scenario. Why? Because first of all, they need to do something they're not suited for. In order to be more effective, you need to rebirth in a certain way. And the whole idea of that system, why it was all started, is to preserve status quo, not to become something new, but to remain what they were. And one more moment. We call this model personalist autocracy. Personalist autocracies are not liked by politologists, because even other autocracies, they shine by the complete rejection of institutes. In reality, you cannot survive without institutes, because the country is big, there are different aspects, so each part of the country manages itself without these institutions, and they manage however they can. But some most important decisions are being taken, being made by that main person and his friends. How he makes decisions, we've all seen on the 21st of February, on that well-publicized meeting of Defense Advisory Council. So the whole population is looking up to the leader, he is supposed to provide stability, but since he is a person, he also can go a bit mad in his head. And there are no institutions in the country to hold him when he makes these mistakes. So instead of providing stability, he is providing this unexpected outcomes. And the whole country is just looking at him and can do nothing because all checks and balances were tediously removed during the previous 20 years. And this uh, leader, being a physical person, as everybody else, will also die at some point, like everybody. And just like in a poem, you'll fall as the leaves fall from the trees and you'll die as your last slave. A poem by Gavrilo Dejan. And what do you have after that? You have a deinstitutionalized space. That's when people start remembering the golden times of the great leader. Why didn't you like living under Hussein or under Gaddafi? Why didn't you love him as he deserves? Look how much worse it is after them. Of course it is worse after them, because this is where they brought you to. Because after these dictators, there is only a tarp field with aluminum cucumbers on it. And you know who else lives on that? Those who lived under the tarp. Radical groups. They do not usually partake in public politics, and they were never prosecuted, like the opposition. They have people, ideas, the list of grievances, usually pretty long, a list of issues they want to address, and they have a vague idea that unites them. And they very often take power after the fall of that so-called father of nation. That's why Ivan the Terrible, after his death, left dark times. Will elite be able to aggregate, to get together and try to get rid of the excessive issues left by the father of nation? They failed to do that after Ivan the Terrible. Russia fell into disrepair for decades. After Stalin, it managed, more or less. Given that Politburo was uh, comprised of very scared people with a lot of criminal background, they somehow figured ways to agree with each other. This actually is a good example, even though Soviet power has very few good examples. It remained. Big Terror did not come back after 1953, and Soviet power acquired for about 15 years, some general human-like features, and maintained them till 1968. Again, no asanas to socialism, but uh, till 1968 it was a somewhat brighter period in the Soviet history. Where are we going with this too? Our inertia scenario cannot continue forever by natural causes, because system is hanging on one person, and his growing isolation and accumulating strangeness and strange actions and force system to act independently. Not the system as a whole, but 
each uh, individual part is more or less inclined to start acting independently on their own. Remember those parts that it was proud of, they really didn't work for it. But which ones do work? This is also very interesting. First of all, financial economic bloc, central bank, minister of finance, minister of economy, civil and bureaucracy, widely speaking, including regional, and businesses, of course. The architects of gray schemas, organizers of the parallel imports, those unsung heroes, so, so to say, who are holding Russia more or less fed and uh, at where it is now, and more or less dressed. This is due to them. When people are saying, look, Russian economy survived the sanctions. I don't quite understand the sanctions uh, that much. It's not my field of expertise, but I understand what is uh, what causes stability of a system. And stability of that system is only due to the fact that it's partly market economy. And it's somewhat open to the world. That's why when it was shut on one side, it started creeping out to in other directions. Everyone who is talking about transferring all that into onto military tracks and about implementing government planning, he's a real fighter with regime because the true pillars of that system are central bank and minister of finance. That's what holds them. Now building our scenario, we can look at the proportion of powers between these groups. The more we have so-called Glazyev supporters, the faster the path to degradation will be. We see that system has some reasoning within it. It is afraid of radicals. It doesn't let them, not even to the levers of power, but to the media platforms. And those who organized some media platforms in Telegram, they recently departed to KGB prison in Lefortovo. Why? To shut up. So here, that political machine still has enough sense to protect itself. It is afraid of radical steps. Due to that reason, our inertia scenario can be branched at this point for two major pathways. First, let's imagine that desires of our system happened. Nothing happens on the front. The front doesn't collapse and crumble completely. And they manage to hold somewhat the territories that they occupied initially. And then Western coalition at some point might decide to freeze the status quo and to just be happy that Russia is not escalating that situation further by any nuclear means or is not throwing more people on the front. So without acknowledging these territories officially, let's freeze. And let's also imagine that their wish that Trump becomes president is granted and somehow manages to reach certain deal with uh, Putin's uh, government. And some deal is concluded with Russia, so it would not become completely pro-Chinese. However, as far as I understand in these matters, I think Western world would likely suggest, would offer something to China, so China would not support Russia too much. But let's imagine that branch. Presidential elections of 24 occur, they happen successfully in Russia under internal politics, which basically is happy with a lower level of people's activity, will not try to pretend Central Asian and I should not uh, probably use Kazakhstan as an example, Kazakhstan is different, uh, but let's say Turkmenistan. So we'll still do some sort of elections with some almost invisible but existing alternative candidates, XYZ, with a well-known pattern of Snow White and Seven Dwarfs. And people are tired, they don't want anything, they want to just be left alone and quietly die. And nobody is protesting. So nothing happens in Russia as it happened in Belarus in previous elections. So at this point, they would have thrown themselves over that fence, luckily landed on the other side and lying there and breathing heavily, happy that something kind of worked. In this fashion, 
Russian Federation is trying to survive till 2030, somehow thinking about successors to the current leader. So in some fashion, they find themselves in 2020, except for the pipe is lower, smoke is weaker, not enough money, and the big question of international isolation is looming over. Then they can, of course, change constitution, reinforce federal council and federal uh, Moscow, Moscow part of the political system. Or you can do nothing and you can just find the successor to which most political players in the country, groups in the country, would agree with. And in that mode, they can survive till 2030, praying to Chinese medicine and whatever imports they can get. In the meantime, Ukraine fortifies borders. Yes, they get more weapons and they become stronger, but they do not attack. And Russia somehow tries to incorporate the occupied territories in their administrative reality. From time to time, somebody is being shelled, somebody dies, but more or less everything is stable. As long as somebody is still buying our oil and gas, Russian budget will have money. They will not become completely destitute. And they will be spending money by Venezuela scenario for protection, army, and the poorest. Everybody else, get by as you can. And maybe making some money because there will be still some citizens living in cities and they'll be providing services for money to each other. So something like that. Chinification, yes, creeping Chinification will be happening because in order for that to continue, Russia would still need to turn off YouTube in some fashion and to also control internet. But Chinese are not really sharing their technology. Russian managers have stolen money and fled, so the results will be so-so. And that's the most likely scenario. There is nothing physically impossible in it. It is comparable with real conditions. In general, it is okay for the system, and it's not tragic for the rest of the world. And Ukraine remained. So there is no huge victory that would allow our autocracy to become an example, a shining example for all other autocracies on the planet. And different parts would be looking at Putin and thinking, oh great, I want to do the same. Now, in this version, which is top of dreaming for the current system, there is nothing amazing. And very few autocracies would even want to look at that scenario. Autocracies want to survive and to be integrated with the world. And this scenario actually is an almost complete isolation scenario, and it's not appealing. In this scenario, president is not going anywhere, even to friendly countries, so-called. Some African leaders will probably be still visiting him. The ones who are in power in Africa due to the efforts of Wagner and other Russian military action. So that's how they can continue. You cannot call it Iran or North Korea. They're not exactly alike, but some, somewhat like that. Second scenario, I would say, is a variation of the inertia scenario, but with some variance because what we described is not exactly a gift to elites. Of course, they remain in power for the most part. They, for the most part, can transfer money to their kids, but they remain in a rather small space where there is fewer and fewer guarantees that power and property and life can be preserved. Just like in Boris Godunov. Are we sure in our poor life? No, we're not. In this variant I described, power belongs to power groups and they need to continue feeding on somebody. So there will not be exactly enough stability in the system. So for collected bureaucracy, even for the asset holders, this is a rather concerning balance of things. So yeah, they can survive, but they don't want to live like that. They want more predictability. They want some protection. And where do you get it? by sending kids abroad and some property abroad, it will, be, it will become more and more difficult. They'll continue doing it, and that's happening. Russian citizens are withdrawing money at a rate that we haven't seen during the whole post-Soviet history, something unimaginable. This is not IT engineers and their moms who are sending money to each other. People are moving households, families, clans, 
that are quietly under the radar transferring money to safe places and they're sending their kids abroad. And it's interesting to think, pause for a, thing, a second and think that these are some elites when the best they can do for their kids is to throw across the fence of the concentration camp where they live, give them some goodies in their back and tell them forget about your last name, say that your name is something else and never acknowledge that you're my relative. So that's not exactly an appealing perspective. That's usually not what people dream about. So that variant of the inertia scenario is in these elite groups, 10,000 families that own Russia, or maybe even a hundred families that are actually rule the country. They start to think how to slowly, carefully creep out of that situation where their unpredictable leader put them to. Nobody is invested into this war as that leader. Nobody is associated with the war as the leader. And this is the other side of personal aristocracy. Everybody else can say, yeah, we fulfilled his orders, but there is no other option for us because we would be executed otherwise. Again, of course, they will have to say that to a criminal court, to high tribunal, but they can still try. Where I'm going with this is that they can try to sneak out if they can find a way to get rid of beloved leader. He was their guarantor of stability, he was an asset, now he is a liability, now he is a source of instability. Of course, Pigozhin, mutiny, mutiny of the weekend, they do provoke these thoughts in the heads of different people. Not only 100 families that I mentioned, but others, a bit level lower, but with ambitions, who might have an idea that he is smarter, stronger, more decisive than Prigozhin. Didn't have cancer, doesn't have half of his internal organs cut out. Young, happy and healthy, and is loved by his comrades, and he can do something. That may not have such a theatric appearance as Prigozhin mutiny. It could be much duller event. You wake up in the morning and you read some message in the newspapers or you listen to the same state news where Yekaterina Andreeva with the face of that Chucky doll and telling everybody that Vladimir Vladimirovich got some issues with his health and will stay in Sochi for a while and now according to the constitution prime minister will fulfill his duties and sometime later they may tell that during the next 90 years there'll be new presidential elections we knew before that, but thank you to Prigozhin, he showed everybody that not a single dog would not even come out to the road, not even to protect, would not even bark for the leader. They would not even remember that he existed and they'll forget his name. They'll forget about him immediately like a stone thrown in the swamp. There would not even be circles on the water. And there'll be some commentary about what's his name? Vladimir Vladimirovich or Vasilievich, we had one, but we're too busy now. So everybody will ignore him. And now, like in Bulgakov, and now after we solve this matter, let's open ladies' fashion store. So what they will be doing, they will try to reach some inner elite consensus to prevent inner fighting. That's what they're afraid of. If Putin disappears with all his strange quirks, they might find each other at their throats. So they're somewhat concerned with that option. But in this case, they can actually come out to the world with some option to trade. Look, we had this horrible leader who started the war, who couldn't even fight it. And let's come to some agreements. And of course, it is difficult to acknowledge some junta if you're an international community, but you can come to Russia and say, okay, organize some sort of elections and we'll let you sell some oil to us in some numbers. I wouldn't even detailize this trade. It will be long, partly public, mostly off the radar, will be pr pretty dirty, not pretty. Somebody will probably fall out of the window during negotiations and their friends and relatives will survive that. And this is a subtype of the inertia scenario. Then. We need to call for another branch here. 
scenario 1.2.1. When that happens, leader disappears and inner elite process starts, but it stalls and fails. And that's when the inner fighting begins. The probability of this scenario increases because everybody is armed now. The last order that decree that governors can have their own armies in regions. And we recently were told that Belgrade territorial defense is now getting weapons. Congratulations to Belgrade citizens and also the neighboring parts, neighboring regions. Understandably, these regions will also not stay away from that process. Private military companies exist not only under Prigozhin, they also are owned by other corporations. Deripaska is now suing some journalists for calling Wimpel and Wovsen, uh, Bubsen, whatever names you find them. Gazprom has the same. Rosneft has the same. Many has similar organizations. And now imagine that all these tools are being used to try to redivide the property. Everybody thinks that now I can shoot everybody else and I will be the new Putin. So an ambition of that sort. Is it possible? Is it achievable? In general, it is. But it's more likely that this bickering will lead to everybody getting weaker, and they will still have to come to some agreement at the end. But this option is lies through the stage of not even civil war. For civil war, you need big groups of uh, civilians involved in it. Who will they? So these fights will be occurring only between the parties that are indeed fighting each other just like back in the 90s when the gangs were trying to redivide the country and of course there'll be casualties of those who are just passing by but these are the versions of the inertia scenarios so basically the system at its core will continue to preserve itself it can survive after the leader's death those variations of the inertia scenario that we described can be called a dragon with three heads a sort of a hydra it's results of the same premise that the system will remain will retain itself there will not be a, a complete economic collapse or complete military defeat or the death of a leader will be so sudden that it will preclude any negotiation options between elites the last is less probable regardless of who dies those elites are still in place and they'll find ways to negotiate and communicate with each other to support their interests. They usually have enough wits to go about that. So what we are describing is an inertia degradation scenario where the system retains and eventually crumbles and gets older and weaker. And it's not even a full collapse. It's more of a gradual crumbling or settling down. That Imagine the castle was shining and looked so strong and it didn't collapse, but it starts to fold into itself and it gets a little weaker, a little shadier, and eventually his contours are fading away. But given that our elites are strong and that our system is not like a pile of snow that slowly melts in spring, that system will continue to exist. and. If you maintain some sort of perimeter, some sort of a framework within, you can actually try to educate the next generation of citizens who will try to maintain the same framework. And if you succeed, they will not try to change that system. Why are we calling that a degradation scenario? Well, first of all, because no development is possible in the system. Militaristic dreams that will wash our face with blood and will revive as a new nation with new unity or that orientation towards the east will free us from colonial exploitation by the west and will grow economically we won't even comment on that these are fantasies they're just compensating for different things from the portfolio of whatever our roof may be leaking but we can see further from our window now so these are silly propositions we will not talk much about that. But we understand that this system will not really grow and develop. It can only drag itself for as far as it has enough resources. 
What other options exist? We can look at one more alternative scenario that people talk about and we'll try to explain why it is not really a viable one. And we'll try, even though it takes some mental effort to draw a scenario that could be called more desirable for Russia if we wish any good for that country to come than everything described. Because all these scenarios described, they are desirable maybe for elites, but only short term. On the long term, these are not desirable. This is not supporting their interests. This is not providing space where they can enjoy their riches and preserve and transfer them to their kids. So about the alternative scenario that people listen about, that people often talk about. A break of Russia, civil war, a complete break up into regions. Why do we not want to spend time on that? Not because it is too scary to think about. As the ancient said, your brain doesn't know shame and it doesn't quite know fear as well. We can think and hypothesize about anything in science. And that's why we are doing some sort of scientific analytical work. But the problems with these scenarios is that whoever brings them up, he's uh, making that statement, that thesis, a break of Russia and a war of everyone against everyone. Okay, so what's next, if we ask him? Civil wars, they happen, but they don't last too long. For example, let's remember 1917, or remember the dark times after Grozny, Ivan the Terrible. Every dark time is good. We know what it's bad with, right? But it's good because something else happens after it. The country will not disappear, and people will not completely annihilate each other. They will kill enough. They can kill enough people. If you look at Russia, at what was happening at the second decade of second and third and actually fourth decades of the 20th century, you can be surprised that the country still has people living there. In our history, very often mention, it's, it's even briefly mentioned that typhoid and the Spanish flu epidem uh, epidemics, those were hundreds of thousands of victims, but this was much less bloody than what was actually happening in Russia at the time. So the first half of the 20th century was just complete bloody murder happening in Russia. Almost nothing else happened. Sometimes they got distracted uh, with a lot of casualties too, to build some factory. But for the most part, Russians were just killing each other. And these demographic losses are intolerable. We can see that in our demographic pyramid, but the life on this territory still continues. And even Russian language after certain changes is still there it shows us that people are not exactly deletable and the peoples rem remain. And even government organizations manage to revive itself. So we can look at the scenario of war of everybody against everybody is not as an end scenario, but as a step. Of course, many people will not survive that. It will be the end of the history for them. But if we want to look further, that after that, there'll be some new concentration, a new configuration on that territory. New configuration after dark times on that territory very often is authoritarian or even totalitarian, just like it happened with Bolsheviks, who managed to reconstruct the country on new bases that required more casualties, even more than the Russian Empire before them, which was, of course, not a vegetarian, but Bolsheviks were com completely outdid the Tsar Empire in this aspect. So that national, God forbid me, revival often help, happens on the background of a lot of victims and that the idea defends that you need to do that. I think the society of the 21st century is not really ready to sacrifice itself for anything. The fact that they don't want to doesn't save them from being executed in the process, but it definitely diminishes the probability of a new totalitarian revival. And revival, yet yeah, has some positive connotations, but I think you understand what I mean. What can happen here? Our inertia scenario. What we've frozen here. Our aging autocracy. Willy-nilly. Somehow, barely survives until that new, until that old generation that is still ruling will not completely start crumbling. Not one person in general, but the whole generation starts to fade away. 
there will be those coffin races. Somebody will take that torch with proper, probably slightly more firm hand, right? Somebody from the next generation. In all that, the kids of high Putin birth rates between 2004 and till about 2016, they grow. They do not live completely destitute, but they are rather poor, not fully isolated, but with some animosity by the external world, with some emotional upset that is boiling around them that they could have won, maybe even taken Kiev, but somebody was a traitor, inner, external, elites, bosses, foreigners, somebody is eating our pie. And that's that broth that this generation is boiling as it grows. And then they start to romanticize, not Soviet Union, but let's say Putin times, the years of his, the years of, of their childhood. There was order in the country, you could travel around the world, you had more goods, you had less of palm oil in your food. So everything was a bit better. And everything could still be ours, if not, and then a huge list of traitors to follow. If we are cosplaying, not the Second World War, but the First World War, that gives us a very peculiar perspective. I would still say that most historic parallels are very rough examples. They're not too exact in this case. But imagine this generation grows up and those who were born in 2006, for them to become active, you need to have at least 25 years to have passed since that time. In order for them to become some sort of managers, bureaucrats in the country, they need to be 30, 35. So you add that to 2006, you add 30 to 2006, and you get 30s of the 21st century. Russia in that time would have quite a few young people, definitely more than before and more than they will have later, and they're not happy. Those who could move, they left. The ones who are there, the ones who could not leave. It's a big country, not everybody can leave. Those who left, we don't count them, but those who remained, they of course moved to the biggest agglomerations, of course, St. Petersburg, Moscow. And there are a lot of people among them from republics of Central Asia, our main working hands reservoir that also produces a certain tension in society. And these people can be infected with a real resentment. Not the one that Ernst imagined on his state TV, but the real resentment, because these people would have to regret, would have things to regret about, because how catastrophic was the failure of Soviet Union, or was it the time of new capabilities? That all depends upon your interpretation. But the war always brings grief. You cannot interpret that. And on one hand, it brings grief, but on the other hand, they could remember that their dads were getting triple salary. They didn't even have to work in a military complex, they could work in a textile factory. Those are also working, and people are buying clothes. But the war is over, the orders are over. And people are used to a higher income. So this is a much less desirable perspective. And in order for this to not be realized, we need to find a way to not make sure that they don't boil in that line of thinking for too long. And we should preclude the foreign world from thinking that the only way is to isolate Russia completely. First of all, it's impossible. Second, it's dangerous. But this is the task for political classes. Let's draw something happier, speaking ascientifically. Now, this is not a scenario of a democratic revolution. This also can be drawn, but this is very unlikely at this point. There is not enough social base in the country for that. But a good scenario for us looks like this. If the current regime will fight so unsuccessfully that it will lose its authority in those countries and regions that are looking at Putin's force, at Russia's force, and whatever can be achieved with that. So you cannot become a viable example of successful autocracy. And you cannot be 
as if you cannot be a successful example, then you know those same African dictators will be pointing at you and saying, we're not as idiotic as those guys, right? So in this case, the rhetoric of empire, of military, will be compromised for a long time. Similar as democratic rhetoric were compromised by lack of successes in the 90s. All these talks about greatness of Russia will be associated with that failure. Last time when we talked about it, the drone flew in, so now we don't want to talk about it. Demographic dynamics will also support that. We were talking that our young generations will be growing, right? But for now, our society is still rather old, and it'll get older. The birth rate is not growing, to say the least. The length of life can be increased a little bit, but for that we need to stop investing into military and start investing into education and medicine. But our older aging society, and in case of Russia it's mostly elderly women, this is not the society who wants to rematch the war as they did last time. The most passionate ones the war will take. It already took a lot of them and continues to do so. The ones who will return, for the most part, will be decorations in sanitariums and not in the meetings and barricades. The others who might come back slightly more alive and healthy will probably be decorations or active functionaries in various ter kinds of gangs in the country and will likely have a short biography as well. But what will be good out of this is that we will not be able to continue being the global trickster, because Russia is a global trickster. We always pull weird shit around the world to disrupt things. So if we'll fail to continue doing that, and the world will, in the meantime, refresh their system of international security, that for some time, nothing is forever, but for quite a long, in terms of historic time frame, will stop any Russian power from thinking about rematching and militarizing itself again. Then these resources might go into internal development, which will continue to request more development. It, even now, it's still internally, Russian regions want to develop other regions, not military. When they're being asked what government has to spend money on, they answer, like I said here, education, medicine, infrastructure, roads, not war. And the value shift of 2010s, despite the war, continues. And it is the nature of it is that the quality of life is being valued higher than political grandeurs. The dreams of political grandeur is concentrated in a very small level of society, usually elderly men with experience in enforcement agencies. But they are mostly retired now. And they still have, unfortunately, some of them are still running the country. And there are a lot of men who are not really elderly men, who are not really engaged in production. And they're part of the economy of services, it's just their services are different. They're the, their services are basically security, and that's what they're concentrated on. But if that political direction will be compromised entirely, an international community will be smart enough to not isolate Russia, but to show the perspectives of what will happen if you continue attacking your neighbors, then they might come, what we can say, new Russian isolationism that will change or can change that last flare up of the dead empire energy, dead imperial energy. And the process of the crumbling of the empire will conclude. The country will still seal itself. Internally, it will be not exactly a pleasurable atmosphere, but it will be under different banner. Not that everybody is enemy, but we're minding our own business. Nobody wishes good upon us. We don't have enough money for everybody. Stop feeding those other republics and other places. You see how much irritation these Russia-Africa summits cause in the elites. And first of all, they're very interesting in terms of elites. They do not look at African partners as equals. So they're very upset at Putin for giving the debts, giving the money. They don't like it. Uh, so this isolationism is not exactly a good scenario, but it's better than many others, and it's not militaristic. So this is some sort of a life that was 
getting shape in 2019, but it was interrupted first by pandemic and then by war. We're not looking too far. We don't have high ambitions. We're spending money to somehow treat and heal our aging population, aging and sick population. I would not put a slogan, the whole Russia is our hospice, but something like that. At the same time, the world becomes a safer place because we do not interfere. And in this fashion, one can imagine that the world will then not have to spend so much money on military-industrial complex. But militarization of Europe, I think, is inevitable. Sitting here, I'm seeing that happening here for the next two decades, probably. But imagine that kind of development. This is the scenario I'm talking about. A scenario of nature taking over, where natural processes take over. Because natural processes, that's where they're leading to. What we have now is not natural. It is artificial construct, which is a derivative from autocracy, from concentration of power in the hands of the few. And these few can make decisions that are good for them, and they, they only think that are good. Nobody else agrees with them, but they are trying to convince everybody that that's exactly what you wanted. But that doesn't make this process natural. It makes it explainable. But when this iron hand, it's not even iron, it's bony, will become weaker and will stop holding on to things so tight. The nature will take over. Everything will be grown over by grass. What I'm describing is when the grass grows over. It's not too heroic, but it's natural. Trust nature, it will not deceive you. A society that is getting older, getting sicker, and mostly consists of old women, they do not fight neighbors, they do not suicide themselves, they usually tend to save not really have enough resources for development. There is not much Prometheus fire in such a society and not too much creativity happening. But even about that, I wouldn't worry too much. The country is big, people are educated and talented, and if you don't hit them continuously, do not kill them, they can do a lot of interesting things, almost everything. So if you let them be, there will be development. Look how it happens even in these horrible conditions under this awful management. People still, somehow, find ways to support life. Even this year, there's an interesting boom of individual construction, which is a great process, by the way, because if people get away from multi-story buildings into individual houses, our society will change, because our politics and our politicians continue to parasitize on the remnants of the military barracks and uh, concentration camps. But when you have more property owners, the country becomes different. At the same time, yeah, there are some weird emanations of that society where people are buying apartments in Mariupol, right? When you look in their eyes, you understand that their investment will not bring them what they desire. But again, these people are dumb and whatever they're doing, they are not bombing other cities. They kind of allow others to do that with their money, but they are a very small group, thankfully. But if we say such a low-level consumerist inertia, that's a different direction of inertia, but it's a trend, if that wins over necrophilia and suicidal psychosis that is happening now, that we can work with. And I think this is the most favorable scenario, the most, the most positive scenario you can consider. And on this, we'll conclude our review. Sorry if it is not too optimistic, but... We have not promised optimism, we promised objectivity. Thank you.